Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to um, the Master's Touch Master's Class. And I know that you know that I always thank God on your behalf for, for His grace, that in all things you're enriched by Him, so you won't be lacking in any gift. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Master Class. You know, these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the uh, Word of God. And if you can't make it at time of our broadcast, then know that these messages are archived for your study convenience. God bless you richly as we begin to enter God's presence. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, simply flowing through our lips. We exalt and praise you in your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that hunger for you and, and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for revelation, knowledge, and rhema word, the logos word, and a gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. So elevate your expectation level, and you'll come away with greater in, uh, revelation and a greater heart and mind connection. Today, we're going to be continuing our series on the end times as we line, go line upon line and precept upon precept through the book of Revelation explained. Now, before we begin, we must come into the presence of God fully in order to gain understanding of these messages. So let's do that right now. Soak with me. Revelation chapter 5 continues the vision of chapter 4. The book is the scroll with seven messages, each of which has been sealed with the authority of God. The breaking of the seals would reveal the message inside each part of the scroll. Scrolls normally uh, had writing only on one side, and this scroll contains the tribulation judgments of God. Let's begin. Revelation 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Now we're not specifically told anywhere what this book contains. This is one of the mysteries that will remain until we're in heaven with him and ask him face to face. We know that the right hand of God is Jesus Christ, so whatever this book is, actually the book is a scroll that is rolled up and sealed, Jesus is holding it. And this book that is filled to overflowing and has something even on the back could mean the fullness of time. Perhaps on the reverse side would be it is finished or at or the end. 
And sealed with seven seals just means that it is closed in completeness. Remember, that's the, the uh, seven means complete. These seals could be opened at one, one at a time or at, all at once. If opened at one at a time, they would reveal a portion each time a seal is removed. All right, Revelation 5, verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now, the reason for a strong angel being mentioned here is to show that all the earthly and heavenly strength aside from God's cannot open this book or these seals. The loud voice depicts the angel calling out to see who will come forth to open the book. Now, <clears throat> Revelation 5, verse 3. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. There are some things that man just simply can't do. And this is one statement here that shows that Jesus was and is no mere man. Okay, This says, regardless of where he's located, man doesn't possess the power to open this book. Now, there are some things like judgment that are reserved for Jesus only to do. The seven-sealed scroll is thought to be the title deed to the earth. In practical terms, it seems God the Father holds this title deed, awaiting the return of his Son, Jesus the Christ, to the earth. This powerful scene in heaven indicates that only Christ, who died to redeem mankind back to God, is qualified to open the seals of this scroll and claim his kingdom over all the earth. Only one, uh, one with the, the proper authority could open the book by loosing or removing its seals. Isaiah 29 verse 11 says, the, que uh, uh, the question is, who has the right to judge the, the world? That is, to reveal what is hidden in the scroll and to execute what is written. No man, literally no one, could be found among mankind or angels who had the authority to remove the seals and to read the scroll. Revelation 5 verse 4, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. John began to cry because it seemed that there was no one to open this book. In fact, this, these unworthy men were even kept from looking at the book. Revelation 5, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So, um, <clears throat> Remember, the 24 elders were representatives of the church. Okay, it really doesn't matter which of the 24 this is. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the names of our Lord, are never given by accident, but all convey a part of his nature. Since the Lion is the king of beasts, and since Judah is the ruling tribe of Israel, this indicates that Christ is to come as king to reign over human affairs. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus, of course. Now, in Matthew, we're shown Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and it's interesting to note that even though Jesus is described from, or I'm sorry, is descended from David in the flesh, he also, um, he's also David's go uh, God, the root of David. This, of course, refers to Jesus' incarnation on his first birth with his roots in the family of David. This hath prevailed just indicates that uh, Jesus won the battle. He came against Satan and Jesus won. He won in a way that no one expected when he died on the cross. And Jesus is the only one worthy to open the book. He was victorious over sin and Satan. He alone lived upon this earth free from sin. He is worthy. More than likely, these seals would be removed one at a time. Revelation 5 verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As it had been, as it, as if had, as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is John looking at the same, very same scene with more being revealed to him as he looks. It's almost as if he's astonished when he says, "Lo!" And it's like, "Whoa!" Like we would say, "Oh, whoa!" So here we see him at the throne, and and very near are the 24 representatives of all Christendom. This is an unusual thing here, for Jesus is the right hand of God, and this book is actually held by him, and yet we see him go to take the book and open it. As in dreams, many symbolisms are present here. Where would the Lamb, Jesus, be? But in the midst, 
We saw in the previous lesson how he was in the midst of the church. Here we see him as the perfect lamb sacrifice. Everything that he is surrounded by is significant to his church. Jesus is the central figure in all of this. Now we know also that Jesus is definitely in the midst of the four Gospels. He is the central theme of all four books. And many times thoughts come to us as we are viewing something. These thoughts are not something we see with the eye. Here we see John realizing the death of the Lamb, as well as him resurrected. A Lamb looking as if it had been slain. When Christ completed the work of redemption, he earned the title deed to the earth, as by Adam came sin, so by Christ came redemption. It's a beautiful picture that we see here. And even though the angel refers to our Lord in, this, in his glory as a lion, indicating his power and might, John sees him as a sacrificial lamb. For John sees him through the eyes of faith. Now those who reject Christ will see him as a lion when he comes to judge and to reign over them. And those who believe in him will see him as their sacrificial lamb. The seven horns indicate that all power belongs to him, indicating that the lamb is not weak. A horn, is, as scripture indicates, is power. See Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18. When Christ came the first time as a lamb, though he displayed certain powers, he didn't manifest all of his power. When he comes the next time as a lion, at his glorious appearing, it will be um, uh, as a lion at his glorious appearing. It will be in the manifestation of his omnipotence, his all-consuming power. Now, in Matthew 28, verse 18, we see this verified. Listen to this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This statement is printed in red, which means Jesus himself spoke those words. Now, this was spoken after his resurrection. The seven eyes just means that he possesses all wisdom and understanding. Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. These eyes speak of the judgment of our Lord, including the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit that rest on him without measure. Isaiah 11, 12, uh, verse 2, and John 3, verse 34. So when our Lord comes, he will know all that human beings have ever been thought, of, uh, thought or done. He will know every deed, all right, everything that we've ever done or thought of doing. Every deed will be brought into judgment. And note that seven is God's number of perfection. Therefore, when Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, comes to judge the world at the end uh, of tribulation, it will be as the perfect judge who has all power and who knows all about humankind. Amen? Okay. Now, it should also be kept in mind that he was the sacrificial lamb, but people rejected him. So the seven spirits of God, are the, they, the, they don't mean seven different spirits, but the seven characteristics of the whole, one Holy Spirit. It should be kept in mind that these characteristics are not limited to his role in heaven. His role during the tribulation or his role during the church age, but uh, they are an eternal part of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, in addition to the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5.22, we should expect to manifest these characteristics. Are you ready? The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit of Counsel, the Spirit of Power, the Spirit of Knowledge, the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord, the Seven Spirits of God, and that just means that all the Spirits of God dwell in Him. He has all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Him. These seven spirits of God sent forth into the earth are the spiritual gifts to help the Christians mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it begins, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Then it goes on and lists the gifts that will be of help to us Christians. Word of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretations. There are far more than seven, aren't there? Well, there's nine there. Seven is just a spiritual number, meaning the completeness or fullness of the Spirit. So if you wanted to, you could name a hundred more, such as charity, patience, etc. Okay, so Revelation <clears throat> uh, chapter 5, verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. As I said before, this is Jesus, the Lamb, taking the book from himself, because he is the right hand of God. <laughs> Now, Revelation 5, 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Okay. All of Christendom will bow before the Lamb, and we read that every knee will bow, right? And every tongue confess to God. Romans 14, 11. It's a real comfort to know that every prayer that we ever prayed is stored in heaven. Did you know that? 
Yeah. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This beautiful new song proclaiming how worthy Jesus is to receive our adoration will be a magnificent sound. All voices will be in one accord. The song praising Jesus for redeeming us from sin and death will be accompanied by the beautiful music of the harp as stated in the verse before. Now the shed blood of Jesus was and is the redeeming factor. I love the fact that nationality or color or sex or any other separation that man has will not be a factor here. Salvation is for everyone who will accept it. Jesus died for each one of us, folks, whether we are Americans, Indians, Hispanics, Africans, Chinese, Russian, or otherwise. It's our choice whether to accept or reject the gift of salvation. No other barrier exists. Now, in, re in verse 10, speaking of kings and priests, could be considered kingdoms and priests in that kingdom. We're going to see later on in Revelation that Christians will reign with Jesus a thousand years on earth as subordinates to Jesus. <clears throat> so... Uh, just as there were priests with a, a high priest over them, uh, our ruling will be under his rule. Now, we shall um, reign on the earth. A similar promise was given to that multitude which no man could number. Revelation 7, 9. So when resurrected after the tribulation, Revelation 20, verse 4. Um, Together the Christians who were saved before the tribulation, along with the saints saved out of the tribulation, will rule and reign during Christ's 1,000-year kingdom. Revelation 5, verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now this number is not a literal number, and wouldn't be to our advantage to try to figure it out. It simply means this. It means a number too large to count. <laughs> this is a very large company of ministering spirits and, and angels. The voice had to be loud to be such a multitude. Angels, 10,000 times 10,000 equals a million plus the thousands and thousands. Uh, uh, Revelation 5, 12. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The interesting thing here is this that this huge gathering was all saying the same thing. It was total adoration and recognition of Jesus, of who and what he was. Not that they could give Jesus anything, but they realized that it was correct for him to possess all things. Revelation 5, verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Jesus created everything and everyone. And this just means that trees, animals, fish, fowl, and all living beings such as animals and people all cried out blessings to God. The him that sitteth upon the throne could be God the Father and God the Son. Probably the Elohim God because of the separation of the blessing afterward unto the Lamb. Now, this praise was not for a limited time, but was to reach into all eternity. The word sitteth means continuous sitting. Okay. Revelation 5, verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now, these representatives of the Christians are saying, So be it. Amen. That's what it, so be it. Our worship of him will never cease. Even in heaven, we will be praising and worshipping him. In closing chapter 5, we see three outbursts of praise and worship are directed toward Christ and the Father. Now, number one, the beasts and the elders praise the Lamb for having redeemed them through his blood, verses 8 through 9. And for, for, and for, giving, and for giving them <laughs> authority in the future to reign on this earth, verse 10. Number two, myriads of angels also praise the Lamb for His glory and wisdom in verses 11 and 12. And number three, every area of creation worships both the Father and the Lamb, verses three, 13 and 14. The prayers of saints, verse 8, may be prayers for the fulfillment of the Messianic kingdom, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and chapter 8, verse 3. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions or need further assistance with understanding the message, contact me. I'll give you my contact information for our website. 
The website is themasterstouch.org. That's www.themasterstouch.org. Or you may email me there at drstephanie at themasterstouch.org. That's D-R-S-T-E-F-E-N-I. The F is Frank, like Frank. So it sounds like Frank, so it's not S, it's F. Dr. Stephanie, D-R-S-T-E-F, like Frank, E-N-I, at themasterstouch.org. Now, my regular email, masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net, or M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. That's M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. I want to invite you to join Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself every Monday on Spreaker.com at 10 a.m. Pacific Time for Living the Word. This is a program that teaches you how to apply the Word and promises of God to your life today. So come join us on Mondays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com and come expecting to receive. My friends, remember Proverbs 4-7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. That's exactly what we're doing here, dear ones. We are gaining God's wisdom, so be sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. I'll see you again here in the Master's Class on Monday, and uh, where we'll pick this back up again and uh, continue on in the end times. All right? Uh, a tribulation and whatnot. God bless you. Thank mm-hmm. you.